Amen. God, we do rejoice today, Father. We do look to you. We praise your name, God, for what you've done. That all chains are broken, God. We still carry them around, man. I still, I Velcro them to myself, God, and drag them around so much. But Father, you have made a way, uh, Father, for us to have life and life abundantly. And so God, today, I pray that we have open hearts, open minds, God, that you would do a fresh new work, God, as we open up your word, which is new, relevant, and, uh, and God, right for each one of us every day. And so Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Please have a seat. Man, that was such a good worship set, huh? Oh my goodness. To come out here on a snowy morning to make it. I know it took everybody about twice as long to get here. And then to just receive the reward of God in a great um, time of worship is just fantastic. And I hope that you, I hope you have open hearts today. Um, I hope your minds are ready to receive from the Lord because we're going to talk a little bit about milk and meat, the milk and the meat of the word. And what I want is for everybody in the room to get both. I really think we ought to have a nice balanced diet. Uh, but the fact is, if our hearts aren't ready, if you don't want to receive, if you got other things on your mind, then you're going to catch a little bit, but you're not going to catch all that God has for you. And so I would pray that our, our minds are ready and that you, you know, for the next moments with me until we conclude the first service here, um, that you hang with me as best as you can. Paul is dealing with a church that's off track. They're off track because what you'll see in chapter 3 today, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what you'll see today is what Paul's kind of been poking at the last two chapters. What he's finally going to get to is that they've, they've actually gone off of their foundation. You know, you can have issues in your home and I can have issues in, in my home or whatever. Uh, in workmanship and walls and trim and electrical and plumbing and all that. Um, all those things can, can really be fixed. But if your foundation starts to go, um, now you're into you know major, major work to get that thing fixed up if you even can fix it. I remember when we moved into the house that we live in now. It was a beautiful home. We were uh, very excited to uh, move into it. Uh, but then the home inspection report came back. Anybody ever got a bad home inspection report? The home inspection report came back and they said, hey, you know, there's some minor things throughout the house house. But uh, unfortunately, the bottom foundation wall and the top foundation wall are about five inches apart from each other. In other words, the foundation was coming in on itself and we were heartbroken because we really love this home. And so of course, what can we do? What can we do? Well, they ended up having to bolt in these long steel rods that went all the way into you know some sort of bedrock and uh, put these um, steel railroad ties, it looked like, in the foundation wall and they had to wrench it back, basically wrench the wall back and fortify the wall. Um, it was about a ten thousand uh, dollar uh, undertaking, um, and the seller, <laughs> the seller uh, paid for it. Uh, but you know, it's interesting that if your foundation starts to crumble, you're in big trouble. And that's what was going on with the church there in Corinth. They were getting together. They were singing songs. They were having communion. You guys know. Love was flowing. You guys know that. We've talked about that. Uh, but their foundation was off. And so Paul, who's talked about this the last couple chapters, is about to get what is called to the root cause. You guys familiar with root causes? We deal a lot with root causes where I work. Um, and Auburn works there as well. And we deal a lot with uh, issues. Um, and what we are always trying to do is not band the situation and not fix the behavior, what we're trying to do is find out what's the root cause, not even the cause, because there could be four or five or six or ten causes, but where, what is the root of it? What's the, what is really gone wrong that's caused all of these what we'll call symptoms? Now listen, if you don't fix the root cause, you're, I'm, I'm going to give you some hard truth today, <laughs> welcome to C4, if you don't fix the root cause, whether it's at work or whether it's your heart, whether it's your faith or whether it's your marriage, if we don't fix the root cause, whatever you do to fix it is making it worse. Amen. That's a tough thing to hear. But it's the truth because you are now band-aiding symptoms and taking care of symptomatic behaviors that now are beginning to, well, I guess, cast shade or hide the true root cause. And what's going to happen is it's going to come up again and again and again. And I tell you what, time heals a multitude of wounds, but time does very, very poorly for people when there's a problem that goes unfixed. Time can be very bad because as time goes on, things get, well, the foundation begins to go further in and further in and further in. And so Paul starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and he begins to address the root cause. Now, if you have my notes or if you are recipients of my notes on email, we will not get through this chapter. <laughs> 
This I, I've done and prepared for the chapter, uh, but we will probably only get through verse 11. So I'd like to do something a little bit different today. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 11 as we get into our study. And remember, the major themes of chapter 2 are this. Paul said, I don't want to bring anything to you except for Christ and him crucified. Not eloquence of speech, not wisdom. I want you to get Christ and him crucified above anything else. And oh, by the way, as the church of Christ, we ought to have the mind of Christ. Isn't that just a reasonable thing? So that's very practically implementable in my life is to think through the situations I'm in. Am I displaying the mind of Christ? Do I have the mind of Christ myself? And Paul said this in chapter three, verse one, and I brethren could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food for until, until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, Paul is very clear, and you can read the narrative of the Word of God and you can get a good understanding of this. He's very clear. Where there are envy. Envy is somebody got something and you're like, Kh. it doesn't mean you want it. It just means you're upset that they got it. Somebody got the new job, somebody got the good marriage, or somebody got the good, you know, good looking, you know, whatever it is, or whatever they've got. Maybe they even have a joy for the Lord. And you look at them and say, how can they have the joy for the Lord? I should have the joy for the Lord. It's not, it's not automatically coveting what they have. It's just looking at them and not rejoicing over what they have when it's a good thing. And so this is carnality. Where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So kids, when you go to school and they want to do division, say no. I'm, all, I'm not doing that. The Bible says it's carnal. <laughs> Where's David? He's upset right now. He's like, yeah, right, bro. For where, for when, verse four, for when one says, I am of Paul and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos wandered, wa <laughs> wandered watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Here we go. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let one each take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation, here's the root cause. Why are things so off, church, in Corinth? For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He gets finally to the root cause and says, man, you guys are off base. And really, this is what's happened in these last days. As the church, many, the love of many has grown cold. As the Laodicean church is definitely the church of our time where Jesus is on the outside. And people are raising up sensationalism, emotionalism, and um, favoritism, <laughs> things like that. These are all things that mark that Jesus is no longer the focus. And the foundation is cracking. Verse 1, back in the beginning, let's look at this and break it down together. I think that you'll be very blessed by the study. And I, brethren, Paul says, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. And that sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm a babe in Christ, a babe. <laughs> hey, babe, you know, but it's not good. There's a debate on this first verse of this chapter. Maybe you've entered into that debate or taken part in this debate before. That debate revolves around were they Christians or not? Were they Christians or not? Was the church in Corinth there Christians or not? Let me ask you this. Let's frame it up correctly. Can a Christian, a Christian, meaning someone who has believed on Jesus, this is all it takes to become a Christian, okay? We don't have anything for you to fill out. We don't have any forms for church membership or anything like that. Somebody who has believed on Jesus Christ for their salvation. Believe that he has taken away sin by his blood and that we ought to look to him for salvation and to go to the Father. Jesus said, no one goes to the Father except through me. Raul Reese just said this week, and Raul tends to be very, well, he gets people all riled up. <laughs> Raul Reese said, if you don't come to God by Jesus, you don't come to God at all. And so a Christian is somebody who has believed on Jesus, and now you have the Holy Spirit within you. 
That's the promise of the Father, the promise of Jesus, that he will send to you the helper, the parakletos in the Greek, the Holy Spirit, to teach you and lead you in all things, the very Spirit of God. And now my heart, which is sinful and full of sin, after receiving Jesus, paying for those sins, is now pure and clean to interact with God. And so he delivers his Holy Spirit, and boom, he and I are now together. We are back in fellowship. That is what it is to be a Christian. And so can a Christian, having the Holy Spirit within them, can a Christian be carnal? All right, cool. I like that. You guys are good to go. Many of you are like, what's carnal? Did he say carnivore? Can Christians be carnivores? What does that, what does that mean? You know, he, yes, they can. That's right. I know some of you are like, no. <laughs> but maybe you don't know what carnal is. And I want to make sure that we break down these terms so that we're not too churchy. Carnal basically means behaving. This is the basic meaning of car- carnality. To be carnal is when the Bible says that they are carnal. It's behaving according to the flesh. Behaving according to the flesh. Now, again, one more level down. What is the flesh? The flesh is a term we use. Listen, this is great educational stuff for maybe some folks that have never been taught this. The flesh is a term that we use, the Bible uses, the church uses for the affections, the desires, the habits, and behaviors of a person. So your desires, what you want to do, and my behaviors, what I actually do that are contrary, not like the heart of God. That's the simplicity of what is the flesh. Something I desire or do that is not like the heart of God. And so if I'm carnal, then that means I'm walking in the flesh. That means I am manifesting a desire or a behavior that is different than the heart of God. Okay? So the debate rages. Can a Christian be carnal? Yes. Y'all say it. Y'all know it. Most of y'all. Can a Christian be carnal? Yes. Do you ever, do you, you Christian, right? Some of y'all are Christians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you ever know what is right to do and not do it? Have we not just proven the point then? We know what is right to do, and yet we'll do something that is different than what we know what is right to do. And therefore, we can be, at times, carnal. Well, except for me, I always do what's right. Give me a break! Isn't that dumb to even say? Isn't that stupid to even think? Paul describes three types of persons in the first three chapters of this book. There is first, and I want you to understand this, there is first the natural man. It's 1 Corinthians 2.14. We've already covered this, the natural man. This is somebody who has not received the Spirit of God. Somebody who has not believed on Jesus, and therefore they don't know God, and therefore they are what I'll call the first nature person, all right? The natural man is somebody with their first nature because when you come to God, when you give your life to Jesus, man, he installs in you and in me a new nature, all right? A new nature. Then, second person that he describes is the spiritual man, 1 Corinthians 2.15. This is the one who is filled with the knowledge of God, and as Paul said here, judges all things correctly and wisely. Do you always do the right thing? Absolutely not. But do you know what is right to do? Oh, yeah. In the black and white situations of right and wrong, you know what is right and what is not, to, what is not right to do because you have the Holy Spirit within you. The choice of whether you do it or not is a whole different conversation. Then... There is the carnal man. So we have the natural man, the spiritual man. And then there's this carnal man, a third type of person. This is the one who knows the things of God and yet in some significant way continues to walk in the flesh. Okay? That's the carnal man. You know, because you can't be carnal unless you know what the right way is. Do you understand? If, If you don't know what the right way is, now you're just a natural man. But if you know what the right way is and yet you make the decision to walk in a way that's not the right way, now that describes you, me, this church, Corinth, as carnal. The question is, which one are you? I mentioned this on Wednesday. Are you a worshiper that occasionally walks in the flesh? Or do you walk in the flesh and occasionally worship? Which one are you? You are most certainly one of the three. Most certainly. Spiritual man, spiritual woman, natural man, natural woman, or carnal man, carnal woman. But let me be clear, just so that we can um, close the debate. First, pragmatically, I want to be clear. Paul begins by saying to them, brethren, 
He calls them brethren, and then he ends by calling them babes in Christ. Therefore, he is quite obviously identifying them as Christian. I just want to be you know, very clear so that we can understand what's being said here. If you ever get into this conversation, and o- over time you will encounter this conversation in what I, what's called Christendom. Now I want to talk to you about the practical side. That's the pragmatic side. That's the side that we can just see in the Word of God. It's very clear. Now the practical side. I am confident that carnal Christians are among us. I am confident someone, someone might, don't look at your spouse. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we probably know a few, we probably have been carnal some, sometimes that we can think of, or maybe even this week, a very important truth to remember, a very important truth to remember is that it's not your performance that makes you a Christian. It's your position. And that one got a little bit of Holy Spirit on it. You know? It's your position. Are you in Christ? Believing on Christ, man, the demons believe Christ. They, be, they believe he is who he is. They believe he, when they came to, notice and study the demonic reaction to Jesus in the scriptures. They tell him he is who he says he is. They worship him. They obey him. And these are things that, man, you might say, well, I, I do these things too. Okay, but are you in him? It's positionally, that's what, that's what makes you a Christian. Now, I have no confidence And I am concerned for one that is apparently dominated by the flesh. I have no confidence in the salvation of someone who is dominated by the flesh. But I am not in the storm of their heart. All right? And I wanted to make this very clear. And when people say, well, I don't want to be judged in all this, in our vernacular, that means let me live my life. But in truth, when the Bible says we ought not to judge another master slave, what that means is even if somebody is dominated by the flesh, I can have no confidence in their salvation, but I do not know the storm of their heart. I don't know what's really going on inside their heart. What I do know is this. I'm saved as saved can be. Have you ever checked your salvation? You're like, what does that mean? Like, God, are you there? Oh, yeah, I don't want to kill that person right now. Yeah, okay, God, you're there. <laughs> Wait, now I do. Are you there, God? You know, <laughs> I have checked my salvation many times in my life and looked and examined my own fruit. You know who should be the number one judge in your life is you. If you judged yourself, nobody else would need to so much. And I do that all the time with myself, inspect my own fruit all the time, man. And I know that I am saved as saved can be. I love the Lord and I want to do nothing but honor him with my life. And yet I am an idiot. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's going on in your heart. You don't know what's going on in mine. You might just be stuck in the moment where the idiot is coming out. I am carried away sometimes so easily by my flesh, but I trust in Jesus. And therefore, what I just said, I think is completely reasonable for each one of us. And therefore, hi, hi, why? (laughs) How or why, why would or should or could I be surprised, so so surprised when someone else does the same thing? You see what I'm saying? Why would I be so surprised, man, if someone I know that I have great confidence that they were with the Lord and then they just go off the deep end? Why would I be so surprised? And we're so quick to tell people they're no good or to think of somebody as no good just because we're caught in their idiot moment. I said it on Wednesday. I'll say it today because those that weren't here Wednesday, I think the church nowadays and me personally, maybe you as well, have a problem. And that problem is I think my candle burns brighter if I snub yours out. It's not the truth. Perceptively, I just want to be the only light in the room. I I just want it to be all about me. But the truth is we shed and share more light when both of the lights are burned brightly. I don't think, I don't think here this verse, what we've talked about, the debate that rages about verse one, I don't think this should be the focus of the verse at all. It's interesting how Christians can get caught up on the minor things. The thing about this verse is that Paul, and this goes for us, God through Paul has outstanding hidden manna of joy, wisdom, strength, purpose, depth, integrity of character that I cannot touch or even glimpse outside of knowing God and following him. All of that Paul has to share with the church in Corinth and God has to share with us, but we cannot hear it because we're not listening. We're not listening. We're not listening. That should be the focus of this first, ver- this first verse is that we're a bunch of babies in Christ and we can't hear what God has for us. 
And so Paul continues, verse 2, I fed you, Paul says, with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. What does this mean? We've talked about carnality. What's the flesh? Now he's talking about milk and meat. What's he doing? Opening some time. A food truck? What's he doing? Milk and meat. He's got a food truck in Corinthian. Corinth? What's it called? Kentucky Fried or Corinthian Fried Chicken? I messed it up, April. I messed up my joke. <laughs> Last night we're sitting in the living room and I said to April and Madison, I got such a good joke for tomorrow. I'm going to talk about milk and meat and then I'm going to say Paul was opening Corinthian Fried Chicken. And then I messed it up. Come back in second service. I'll get it second service. It's okay. If you eat at Paul's Corinthian Fried Chicken because he serves milk and meat, I want you to know that you can't pay with cash. You have to use PayPal. <laughs> That was good. It would have been better if the first word... Don't give me that look, April. Why don't you just look down? Do you give me that look like I'm an idiot? She's like this. Way to go, loser, you know? You're going to give me some KFC later. I know. I'll get you, girl. All right. (sighs) Newborn babies. Newborn babies are absolutely beautiful. We were at the servants' dinner Friday night, and um, and JoJo was there uh, with her parents, and she is just absolutely beautiful. Little babies are amazing. That's all of a person. Think about this: all of you, everything that makes up a person, head to toe, packed into this little tiny package. They're amazing. Who will they become? What will they do? The sky is the limit. I remember when I graduated college, my stepmother gave me a book, Oh, the Places You Will Go. Have you, do you ever give that book to somebody? It's a very famous book. And I, you know what I did? After, I'd gone, excuse me, I had been, I squeezed four, year col- four years of college. I squeezed into five. All right. I knew. So, Kathy doesn't like any of my jokes at all, ever. I love you so much. I love you so much. She never laughs at me. Um, and I'm sitting there looking at this book going, whatever, man, I know everything. <laughs> I just finished college. <laughs> oh, the places I will go. <laughs> Don't you know I've already gone so many places? I'm so stupid. <laughs> Here I am, you know, so many years later. No, it's the truth, man. You just don't know what God has in store for you. And as a little babe in Christ, man, what do you need now? All this, all this capacity that God is beginning to unlock. You need milk. Why? Why does a baby need milk? Stomach is not ready yet for solid food. And oh, by the way, no teeth. You know, <laughs> First Peter 2, 2. What is the milk? Because we got to understand this. I want you to understand what's carnality, what's the flesh, what's the spiritual man, what's milk? First Peter 2, 2 says this. Laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. We just flip past that and we read, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the world. But you've got to understand, you cannot have a desire for the pure milk of the word until you lay aside. See what I'm saying? Until you repent, you turn from malice and turn from deceit and turn from hypocrisy. You turn from envy. You turn from evil speaking. You turn from all this and you turn towards the Lord. As a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. The milk, when Paul says the milk, so that we don't understand this, the milk is our, I'm not sure the grammar here, the first principles of the oracles of God. The first principles, that's the milk of the word, the first principles. If you turn over to Hebrews chapter 5, you can if you'd like. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 says this, For though by this time, by the way, this is one of the reasons why people agree or debate that Hebrews was written by Paul because of some of the similarities to the other Pauline epistles, the other Pauline letters. Watch this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Okay, you understand? A baby is amazing. A baby is thrilling. But a carnal Christian is one that over time does not develop. Over time does not mature. And that can be tragic. That can be very much damaging. Hebrews 5, again, verses 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 
but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Here we go. This is why it's tragic to, to walk as a Christian and yet never develop and never mature because you will not be able to discern between good and evil. And I'm not talking about good and evil like, okay, does that mean thou shalt not kill, thou shalt kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt steal. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the good and evil of how you're reacting in the situation you're in right now. How you're bringing great shame, perhaps, to the name of Jesus. Because all you're doing is lashing out about how wrong they are without ever, without ever taking any responsibility. That is so unlike Jesus and so like the natural man. Your first inclination is to say why you're this way or defend or to give reason rather than to just take responsibility for how you're acting. Boy, we don't like to do that. But that's what happens. And, and I want you to know, it's not like, okay, I'm either mature or I'm not. Being mature, I can sometimes be immature. Being spiritual, I can sometimes be carnal, okay? So we don't escape this and grow past this. No, Paul says, I die daily. This is something we deal with as we walk with the Lord. Ultimately, to be able to receive solid food means that you have grown to the point of trusting God and obeying God. Those are the same, that, those are the same things. You know that, right? Trusting God is the same as obeying God. If you don't obey God, you don't trust him. You trust you. I want you to know that and understand that. It's growing to the point where you trust God before you will trust your own reactions, emotions, before you will trust your sensations. And through that faith, by experience, as you walk in it, man, as you sharpen those tools and that discernment, you're, you become very keen. You become very sharp but that was not the Corinthian church. They had gotten off base and their foundation had cracked. Now, what I do want you to know, this is not talking about some sort of next level teaching, okay? That if you can receive this, then come into my office and I'll share the real stuff with you. That's very cultish. That's not what this is saying at all. There's nothing, check this out. Here's, here's proof for that, by the way. There is nothing deeper than the gospel of grace. There's no teaching deeper than the gospel, okay? And so when, when we talk about the first principles of God, the word that we ought to uh, think about in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5 is the word again, 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 again. That you just need it over and over and over because you're just not, man, you, haven't re you obviously have not received the gospel of grace because you got no grace. You know what I'm saying? Because if you receive it, you start to flow it. And so there's nothing deeper than the gospel of grace. You and I, we could spend our whole lives just simply um, studying and growing deeper in our knowledge of what Jesus did at Calvary. And so there's no second level teaching, nothing like that. The meat of the word has everything to do with the receiving of the word. As you receive the milk, as you receive it, you trust God, you obey God, you put it into work. Now it's interesting how the meat begins to come. It's not even, it's not even additional knowledge. Uh, uh, not, uh, not in the knowledge level. It's more revelational. From uh, Think about it this way. I can know, if you tell me, you know, um, Jaden is rich. You just say, Jaden, that boy... He is rich, okay? I can know that. You could show me his account balances, his stock profile, but, but let me go to his home. Now, how much better do I know it? Now, let me live with him for a couple days and see the lifestyle that he has. Now, how much more do I know that statement? I can know that he's rich, but now that if I go live, live with him, you know what I'm saying? Now, if, if you, can I move in? You know what I'm talking about? You got room for me? I'll just hang out at the pool. You know what I'm talking about? Now I know at a whole different level, but it's not new knowledge. I don't preach new knowledge or private interpretation or personal revelation. That's all satanic and demonic, that God, would, that God would hold something back from you and give it to me. What? No, no, no. It's me that holds back from God, and therefore I, I can't receive what he's given me. You try to pour the ocean into a thimble, and you're going to have a problem. And I'm not, I don't want to bring a thimble to God for him to fill. I want to bring a, a planet-sized crater. You know what I'm saying? That he might pour all of his goodness in me. And so the meat is not so much that, that I can give you, you know, deeper revelation of God's word because I know the deepest revelation of God's word. Yeah, then now you're going to exalt me and come back to me. No, no, no. It's that you receive the gospel of grace and by walking in it, you start to receive the heart of God and therefore you find discernment and wisdom and power and integrity and character. And you do things, man, and you, and you see God working in your life, man, and you're just like, what is this? 
this and everybody takes a step back and says, that's the Holy Spirit. It's awesome, man. So verse three, Paul continues and says, you're not able, well, and even now you're not able for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Marks of carnality, okay? Marks of immaturity. That's what we've been given. It's been very clear. I want to say this. Marks of foolishness, envy, strife, and division. Foolishness, envy, strife, and division. To pit against, you know, one, to, to, for you, and we've all done this, man. This is why it just, it should hit home for all of us, man, as the Lord just sows these truths into our hearts, man, because we've all been there. If you pit yourself against someone else in the body of Christ, rather than wanting and striving for unity, envy and loving sensationalism or loving only people that make you feel good, these are all sure marks of a carnal Christian, you say, well, they stinketh. I know they stinketh. <laughs> That's why I'm at odds with them, because they stink, man. I don't like them. They're mean to me. The Word of God would say something different. I wonder if you would um, trust the Word of God over your own heart. There's the real question. Do you trust God? Do you obey Him? James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 1 would give you a whole different scenario than you're a jerk because they're a jerk, or you're reacting because of what they've done to you. James chapter 4 says this, where do the wars and the fights come from? from them being a jerk. Ah, oh, hang on, let God speak. Where do they come from, from among you? Do they not come from your, your? See that? We just don't want to take responsibility. And I got to tell you, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm in danger here. I, I have seen in my life, maybe it's because I am a man and I deal with men one way. I have seen in my life that the females are very much slower to take responsibility than men. Men, you know, I go to a man and it's black and white. You're an idiot. You're being an idiot. Why don't you shut up? Stop being an idiot. <laughs> you know, and he'll be like, you know what? I'm being an idiot, man. I know. You know, it's interesting. But if it, you can't, I can't approach in ministry. And this is why I have great partners in ministry, like Auburn and um, Leslie and Lindsay and April and uh, Yvonne and you guys. Um, because if I go and say that to some female, she's gonna just hate me for weeks. It's the truth, man. This is not popular, is it? No, I'm getting a little hot myself. The responsibility, you know, and I want to, I want to challenge you. Now, this isn't everybody, by the way. This is, you know, I'm not. I don't want to broad stroke everybody, but this is what I found out. And kids, you know, kids that have the, you know, they they waffle very quickly. Take responsibility because James chapter four says it's not what's been done to you why you're at strife with them. Think about Jesus on the cross. What was done to him? He, I mean, the enemy. Uh, he, we all were enemies with him, and yet he goes to the cross and stands in the place of his enemy. If we look to Jesus, we will see a great picture of Jesus had no strife, zero with men. Isn't that great? He even died for the Pharisees that put him on the cross. It's amazing. But James chapter four says, "Where do they all come from anyway? They come from you." If I've got strife with you, if Lil has done me wrong and now I'm at odds with Lil, where's that strife coming from? It's not, it's not Lil, it's me. Because I could just say, you know what, Lil, walk all over me, it's okay. Can't you? Don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. My flesh doesn't want to do that. Treat me like dirt, Lil. I don't want to do that. But that's the flesh. The Spirit would put me right to the cross. The, peer, the Spirit would point me to Jesus. And so therefore, I have to take responsibility for my animosity. I have to. Although it's justified. I'm not, I, I, and I want to tell you, you can contend with someone without striving with, with them. And I want to give you that today as well. I don't want to just say, go be martyrs. That's stupid. I'm not saying that. We are not to be weak. So I'm going to teach you. I'm going to at least give you some thoughts on how to contend without striving. But James would say that it comes from your desires for pleasure that war in your members. Well, I thought it was them. No, no, the striving and all that's the problem is me. They come from my desires for pleasure that warn my members. That's a burn, man. That burns in my heart of hearts. That makes my flesh just very upset. But it's the truth. If you think about it, it's the truth. Every time your inner pride is kicked. I remember Chuck Smith used to say that if somebody comes up to you and says, how did you, you know, after a preaching or whatever, how did you know? What, what, are, you, what are you, you be, you're telling my business from the pulpit. No, no, no. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that gets hit. And so, hey, man, if the, every time your inner pride Every time your inner pride is kicked, you have two options. One is a sword and one is a cross. 
Think of the Garden of Gethsemane. Think of Peter and Jesus. You have two options when your pride is kicked. I guarantee you that 9.9 times out of 10, I lunge to the sword. Guarantee you, 9.9 times out of 10, when my pride is kicked, I do not immediately float, levitate, and get close to the Lord. (laughs) I want to lunge. That's what I want to do immediately, even if only in my heart. But here's what I ought to know and what we ought to know. Now I'm going to cover, I'm going to throw out some verses. If you'd like to write them down, you can. We, We will not have time to look at each one of them. But listen to this. Strife, strife is a product not of God. It is a product of hatred. Hatred is not a product of God. Hatred is a product of sin. Love is a product of God. And check this out. Love covers all sins. When Paul gets to the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, he's going to say, why do you go to court? Yes, you've been done wrong, but why not just accept being wronged? This, this is where the mature, the maturity in us will come out is when we are wronged, how do, what do we do? I got an email this week. I want to share this with you and I probably shouldn't, but I got an email this week uh, from somebody who is a uh, Christian dialogue minister. In other words, they go around to churches and they teach people how to talk as Christians, how to relate to the world and relate to each other as Christians. Um, And I got this email saying, hey, I'd like some time on your calendar. I'd like to, you know, meet with you. And I said, great. That's uh, thanks for wanting to meet with me. Um, What is the objective of the meeting? Oh, I would like to tell you about my book, and I'd like to talk to you about a 10-week course with your church um, to teach how Christians ought to talk to each other. And I said, well, um, I will prayerfully pass. Thank you very much. And the response, this is a, I teach Christian dialogue. The response, right to the sword. Oh, well, that was a very quick prayer, pastor. And so my response, the first one that I deleted was, was I rebuke you, Satan? <laughs> That's the first one I deleted. You think I'm kidding. That was my first one, believe me. Because my heart gets pumping. I'm like, boy, here's some rebuke, baby. Woo! You sell a Christian book talking about how to talk to Christians, and you just said, that. what is wrong with you? You know, I'm coming to your house, you know. Uh, but so I wrote back. This is all I wrote back. Confirmation. Confirmation. It's interesting. I want to lunge to the sword. 9.9 times I want to lunge to the sword. But God would say, consider the cross. Love covers all sins. Isn't that amazing? All sins. Proverbs 10.12 says that. Go look at it in your own time. Love is of God. God is love. And love covers all sin. Strife is opposite of wisdom. Wisdom. And I'm going to bring this, to, I'm going to bring this down to, to earth with you because I know there's strife. If you're married today, by our own nature that we have in Adam, we're going to at times be tempted towards strife in our homes. But strife is the opposite of wisdom. That's Proverbs 13.10. Here's another one. Strife is a perversion of how we ought to be. That's Proverbs 16.28. Strife, this should be the one, man. Strife in your home will ruin your children. Strife in your home will ruin your heart for your spouse. That's Proverbs 17, 1. Better is a dry morsel, it says. Better is a dry... You think you don't have money? We don't have the cars that everybody has. We don't have the home. We don't have anything. Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Isn't that amazing? Strife stands in opposition to trusting the Lord. Stands in opposition. If you trust the Lord, strife will squelch. That's Proverbs 28, 25. If you are one to stir up strife, and I look in the mirror because I am one to do this by my human nature. If I am one to stir up strife, if you are one to stir up strife, then you're an infant in terms of how you ought to be. And you know nothing as you ought to know. That is 1 Timothy 6, 4. So if you're one to elevate the discussion to insults and to shouting and to wrath and to grudges, in other words, what you just said, I'm going to hate you for the next two weeks for saying that. Know what you're doing. You are essentially messing up your own diaper, diaper baby. Diaper baby. Now, You need milk. I mean, you need milk. You need to go back to the gospel. You need to go back to the gospel of grace. You need milk again. 
if, if you're one to stir up strife. Paul is saying this about the church in Corinth. I can't give you milk, meat. I got to give you milk. Why? Because there's so much strife. There's so much envy going on. There's so much division. Now, I'm not saying to avoid opposition. In fact, I believe and I pray for this in my own heart of hearts that I am not afraid of any conflict at any moment. I don't want to be afraid of any opposition at any moment, of any conflict at any moment. I want to face it with the power of the one who resides within my heart of hearts. I am not saying to avoid opposition, and I am not saying to disengage. I am saying to avoid strife. You can engage all day long. You can engage all day long without strife. Think of the difference between a game of chess and an MMA fight. Both are intense competitions, but in one, one of them gets completely beat down. And all the nerds just said, yeah, chess. (laughs) (laughs) I want, I want to engage. I want to engage. And the truth is I won't be able to avoid it because problems happen and you won't be able to avoid contentions. But I want to do it with wisdom. I want to do it with self-control. I want to give place to God and to walking towards the cross rather than the sword. When you and I do that, okay? And so I'm not saying don't contend. I'm just saying avoid strife. Strife is diaper baby stuff. Oh, with, ah! you know, and it just goes to, it goes to DEFCON 9 and all of a sudden we're holding grudges and all of a sudden we're being jerks and we can't go to sleep now because I'm so, I hate them so much. I hate them, I hate them. Here's what, here's what we ought to know. When you and I practice contending in opposition with wisdom and self-control and grace and in the words of God rather than the words of our emotions, somehow in some supernatural way, we are reflecting heaven. As Paul says here, when we war, when we enter into strife, all we are doing is behaving like mere men. Isn't that cool? Like you and I, we watch these movies about like Iron Man and Thor and all these, you know, superheroes. But Paul just gave us a, 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 a note there that you and I have superhero type stuff within us because Jesus, the ultimate hero himself, is within us. But all of that is unlocked through walking in the spirit. And when we don't, we're just behaving like mere men, like anybody in the world. The natural man can do what the carnal man does. Did you know that? But the natural man can't do what the spiritual man does. Verse 5 says this. Even so, Paul continues, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great, well, I'm in James. What am I doing? (laughs) I'm like, well, I didn't, what's this? I'm like, my notes don't match that. Okay. Who then, (laughs) who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers, you know what that word means? Slaves, servants, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor, nor he who waters but God who gives the increase. So I want you to see this just briefly. Who are we anyway? That if we were all to divide because I like Harvest and Greg Laurie, no, I like, uh, I like this and whatever, you know, throw some person's name out there. If we are to divide, then, then who are these people anyway? Who am I compared to any other pastor in the area? We are not but servants. Without God, what work are we accomplishing? Without God, what work are we accomplishing here in this place? If something supernatural is going on, listen, don't ever forget this. Why would we exalt the natural? If something supernatural is going on, then why would we ever exalt the natural? What's cool is the tenses of these words. Man, I have become so nerdy in my old age. I just said tenses are cool. Nerd. The planting and the watering, because Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, those are given in a tense that's a one-time event. So Paul one-time plants, Apollos one-time waters. But God given the increase is given in a tense that says over and over and over and over and over. Did you know that God does much more work? After, you know, we spend time together as church, we get together corporately, which God has commanded in his word. We do great things, man. We have wonderful times of study and fellowship and worship. But it's when you leave here, that God starts to give the increase, the increase, the, and it continues, and it continues, it continues as you walk with Him. I love that. I, I love that uh, statement. Verse 8, and we'll make it to verse 11, and then we're through, but Ben, maybe you and your team could come up. Verse 8 says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one. This is cool. And each plants, and now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Listen to this. The reward is not results-based. Isn't that so entirely opposite to the world? 
the reward of the kingdom of heaven, when we walk in the things of God, it's not results-based. Re- rewards are according to the labor. Rewards that God rewards you is according to the labor that you put into it, not the results. How my mind frets at that. How my heart frets at that. Because what can you guys see? The results. See what I'm saying? But God looks at my heart and says, why are you doing it, Matt? Why did you study the Bible this week to prepare a Bible study for your church? Why did you do that? And, and there's something in me that says, because the, re- the results, God, look at that result. That's not good. God says, I'm not rewarding those. I'm going to reward you according to your labor. And then he says this, all of us are a team, all of us on this stage, and all of us in this place, we're a team. But each one, each one is rewarded. You and I will be rewarded individually. Even though we do life together as a team, as a married couple, as a ministry, it's not the college group project where only one person does all the work and everybody gets the same grade. It's not that. God is just in his rewards. And then as we close, verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. Isn't that great? This ministry that we have here, man, this ministry you're a part of, God is right here ministering along with all of us. You are God's field. You are God's building. Here's where we will spend some time next week. Well, week after. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another builds on it. But let each one take heed according to how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If there is a foundation in this room today, whether it's your marriage or whether it's your, your being a, an employee or whether it's being a boss or whether it's being um, a student or a kid in your home, if you've got some sort of foundation under that responsibility that's not Jesus, then you really haven't laid a foundation. And what you're building on, as soon as a storm comes, you're going to see it fall. As soon as the sand shifts, you're going to see a great disaster in your life. And God says, no, 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 lay the foundation of Jesus. I want to give you one more practical point. We, we in this last church age have a great, robust um, ministry called Christian counseling. The original intent of Christian counseling is to come alongside people who are mourning. That's the original intent. To rejoice with people that are rejoicing, to mourn with people that are mourning. Christian counseling should not be about sin. It should not be dealing with sin in your life. You should deal with the sin in your life. You and I should do it. And if you have sin in your life that you need a Christian counselor to come alongside of, then your foundation is wrong. The foundation has an issue. And you are building upon a foundation that cannot stand. And so I would encourage you, and I'm not saying don't do it because I, I understand people need you know, milk and they need it again and again and again. But I just want to give you that truth, that Christian counseling, when you call upon a counselor, it should not be to help you deal with overcoming sin in your life. You have the Holy Spirit. But are you, but are you just being carnal? I'm talking about problems at home, problems at work, problems in your church. You should not need counselor for that. Check your foundation. What are you built on? It's okay to relay the, by the way, it's okay to relay the foundation if your foundation's wrong. It's okay. Or if you lay cement with no steel rebar in it and it starts to just move and shake and crumble. It's okay to relay it, but you've got to have the courage to come to the Lord and say, okay, God, deal with my root cause. The results that everybody can see, the symptoms that keep putting, you know, band-aids keep getting put on, I don't want to deal with those anymore, Lord. I want to deal with the root cause, which means you're going to be exposed, which means people are going to see that you're starting over in the Lord. But I tell you what, man, if you, if you do it, if you do it, then the reward of the meat lays ahead for you. So Father, we, today, God, we love you. We're thankful, God, for your, for your provision for us. We're thankful for the cross, God. I pray that um, you would sow these truths in our hearts, Father, that you would remove anything that's not of you, God. And today, if you don't know the Lord, we invite you to the Lord that you would come out of the natural man, come into the spiritual man, spiritual woman. Yes, you're going to deal with carnality, but God's going to walk you through that. He's going to show you that as you give yourself over to his word, his ways, as you walk in the spirit, as you take in the milk, as you receive the milk. God's going to work with you through that, but you've got to come to him. So to profess faith, 
do it publicly. The Bible would testify that if you profess Jesus publicly, he'll profess you publicly in heaven. And so if you haven't come to the Lord yet, if you're online and you want to give your life to Jesus, he will not re, um, reject you. He will respond with welcome, saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know you've died for my sin, God. But today I place my hope in you. I believe that you resurrected from the grave, God. And I believe in you having been resurrected in you is eternal life. And so God, I turn from my sin. I give you my life, God, today. Help me to walk in your ways. Help me to receive your heart, God, that I might, Father, develop and mature. If that's your prayer, you're saved, man. There's nothing, there's nothing more to do. There's nothing more to give. That's it, you're saved. Now walk with the Lord. Walk with him and learn. If you like today's message or were blessed by it, be sure to like and subscribe now and become part of our community. Also, help spread the great news of Jesus Christ by sharing this message on your social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, so that your friends and family can be blessed as well.